What we have here is the new Mini Clubman. It's longer, it's wider, and it's a little bit lower than before. It's a car which is aiming at the Volkswagen Golf. The Mini Clubman is like the wagon version of the prized Mini. The new generation of the Clubman offers considerably more space than the standard five-door Mini. It's a whole 27 centimeters longer and nine centimeters wider. Its individual style gives it something of a unique appearance but it still has that typical mini feeling, as the vehicle's design chief explains. We have the new Mini Clubman as a very unique car. We created the new Mini Clubman to be quite distinct. Of course, we still wanted to create a real Mini. We wanted to make sure it drives like a Mini, and I can guarantee that it certainly does. But we saw great potential in setting this car apart in terms of the look from other Minis, particularly at the sides and especially the rear. The back of the car is completely new, although it's still reminiscent of the old Clubman, of course, because of the split doors. And it's the split doors that give the Clubman its own character. So the new Clubman is a real Mini, even if it's more maxi than ever before. The trademark protruding wheel arches and the saucer eye headlights have been retained, along with the horizontal structure of the lower body, window line and roof. Overall, the Clubman appears lower than the VW Golf, which is practically the same size. Well, this new Mini Clubman, it's the largest Mini ever produced, but it still has all the typical Mini driving traits, the sporty steering, the peppy engine, and as an extra, this two-piece barn door, which competitors like the Golf, the Audi A3, and the Mercedes A-Class don't have. We're going to test the Cooper S Clubman. It has a 141 kilowatt engine and can go from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in just 7.1 seconds. It can reach a top speed of 228 kilometers per hour. Unfortunately, the whole thing doesn't come cheap. Prices for the version we tested start at 27,500 euros on the German market. And there's a long list of additional features that are also pricey. Well, the good thing about this car is it still feels like a true Mini. It has all the typical traits that you would expect from a Mini. Very direct steering, a powerful four-cylinder petrol engine, and a new eight-speed automatic gearbox. Das Fahrzeug ist Anders Warming says it's a compact car, extremely compact, and its dimensions are small, which is typical of Mini. The front and rear overhang are very short. We've maximized the space available in the interior while retaining the typical Mini exterior proportions that we all love. Mini has rearranged the dashboard, placing the speedometer over the steering wheel. What stayed are the characteristic flip switches, but the overall impression is a little more stylish. Well, Mini has redesigned the dashboard. There's a higher quality to the whole car. Uh, the width has increased, so you get the feeling that it's a bigger car inside. The Clubman offers 360 liters of cargo space. With the back seats folded down, that even expands to 1,250 liters. The Clubman is due to go on the market at the end of October, with prices in Germany starting at just under 24,000 euros. The model will eventually be available in three diesel and three gasoline engine versions. This is the latest generation Mercedes-Benz Actros. Not a rare sight on German highways, but take a look inside. Anything not quite right? This is the world's first self-driving, series-produced truck. The new system is being tested for the first time on the German Autobahn. Until now, the self-driving Actros could only be used in test conditions. Manufacturers have been busy developing the technology for self-driving vehicles, but the government still has to finalize the legalities. Still, the governor of the German state of Baden-Württemberg, 
who was present for this truck's maiden voyage, is very optimistic. Winfried Kutschmann explains the need for politicians to work in parallel with the car manufacturers. There are whole new legal requirements involved, he says, such as liability for accidents and other issues. He says they need to keep up with developments to ensure that politicians encourage progress rather than slowing it down. A year ago, Daimler demonstrated their version for the future with the aptly named Future Truck 2025. The driver can even turn around during the journey and concentrate on something else entirely. In reality, we're not quite there yet. In this truck, the driver must be able to take back control in an emergency. Wolfgang Bernhardt explains how the system takes over the normal driving controls, such as steering, braking, and accelerating during the long journeys that a truck driver typically makes. This gives drivers some relief, but they're still fully responsible, just as before. They still have to sit and keep watch over the system. He compares it to an airplane on autopilot. The driver can sit back, but still has to be responsible and stay alert. Car tester Matas Kurat would never pass up the chance to ride in a vehicle like this. He was always taught to have two hands on the wheel. How does the system actually work, he asks. Martin Seilinger explains that there's an adaptive cruise control that responds to what's going on behind and in front of the vehicle, and built-in electric steering which automatically guides the vehicle in the lane. Montes mentions the S-Class traffic assist system and asks if that's a good comparison. Yes, he says, that's a good comparison. The relevant information is delivered via radar sensors and cameras. It's said to be safer than normal driving because the computer can't get tired and it seems there are other benefits. Wolfgang Bernhard thinks once the network is connected to the Internet and everything's up and running, the traffic will actually flow much better and we'll see a decline in the level of congestion we experience today. That would be another positive effect, he says. Because of the way the vehicle is programmed to drive, for example, with even acceleration and braking, engineers hope that there will also be a saving in fuel of up to 5%. The market launch for the new system is expected in a few years, so you might see driverless trucks out and about sooner than you think. Ford is trying to edge its way into the luxury SUV market in Europe with the second generation Edge crossover. After the success of its Kuga compact SUV, Ford is now going up market. The new Edge models should arrive in dealerships in Germany in early 2016. What began as a concept car at the Frankfurt Motor Show in 2013 has become a reality. The Infiniti Q30 is the result of a collaboration between Nissan's luxury vehicle division, Infiniti, and Mercedes. It's based on the platform of the Mercedes A-Class. The Q30 is slated to go on sale in Europe later this year and will include a sports variant. If you want to test a real supercar, you need a super track and a super driver. Former racing driver Klaus Nietzwitz is trying out the new Audi R8 on a racetrack in Portugal. So we're going out on the Portimao racetrack, he says. It's a fast and challenging circuit and probably not easy for a car like this. Let's see. He says he's going to switch off all the electronic driving aids. Now, it really feels like a racing car, he says. The performance data leave no doubt that the Audi R8 is a racing car, even if it is licensed for public roads. The engine produces a hefty 449 kilowatts of power and needs just 3.2 seconds to reach 100 kilometers per hour. Oh, 
and it has a top speed of 330 kilometers per hour. The engine responds immediately, Klaus says. 560 newton meters of torque is, of course, a lot. It has a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission that is very fast and very precise. It steers much better than its predecessor, he says. It feels a bit softer. It feels generally a little comfier, but the car is still very fast. All-wheel drive is, of course, another plus. That helps you to keep traction when you're coming out of a bend. So here, you hit the gas, accelerate out of the curve, and the car keeps its course. Thanks to the all-wheel drive, there's hardly any loss of traction. Fantastic. A real race car. The R8 looks almost like a carbon copy of its predecessor, but it's actually a completely redeveloped model based on the Lamborghini Huracan. The few changes to the exterior are actually a bit of a letdown. The new R8 lacks some of the exotic and brawny look of its predecessor. The new R8 is wider and comes with a V10 plus engine, making it more powerful. Customers can choose between the V10 with 397 kilowatts or the one we tested with 449 kilowatts. Both versions are equipped with a new and improved faster seven-speed dual clutch transmission. This car will, of course, not only be used on racetrack, he says. Most people will drive it on public roads. And I have to say, it's totally suitable for everyday driving. Audi's made a few changes to ensure that. Away from the racetrack, the R8 takes curves with a stability that is almost disconcerting. There is no noticeable force outwards. It speeds out of the bend thanks to Audi's Quattro technology. The new R8 is really a completely new car, he says. A lot lighter in weight, many parts have been made in aluminum or carbon fiber, and this is how it looks. The existing aluminum space frame has had a substantial amount of carbon added to it. The central tunnel, rear wall, and B-pillars are made from carbon fiber. The body shell is now 15% lighter and boasts 40% more rigidity. That means the new R8 weighs a whole 50 kilos less than its predecessor. Its curb weight, 1,555 kilos. Not bad for a car with all-wheel drive and a 10-cylinder engine. And this is what the V10 engine looks like, he says. It's a 5.2-liter engine with 610 horsepower and a maximum torque of 560 newton meters. What's special is that the car is also designed for the road, and so Audi has installed a cylinder on-demand function. At lower torque and rev levels, one of the two cylinder banks is automatically switched off, which saves fuel. So in the best case scenario, that would mean a full consumption of 12.3 liters per 100 kilometers. But you have to be very restrained if you want to keep to that level. And that's not easy, because the R8 was born to run at top speed. It's surprising what the new R8 can do, he says. It's a real toy to be enjoyed, but also good for anyone who just wants to drive fast. Our car tester Enos is trying out the new Toyota iGo. She thinks the design has seen some big changes and is inspired by Japanese youth culture. Some features have been brought in from higher end models, including the smart key system. She can open the door with the key still in her pocket, which makes getting in easier. She can even start the car with the key in her pocket. All she needs to do is push the button and off she goes. We're testing the Scion Splash model today. Alongside this new blue-black styling, the car now boasts the pre-collision system, which is already a regular in Toyota's higher-end models. 
It's there to prevent low speed collisions when driving in the city. Enos tells us there's only a one liter, three cylinder engine available for the new iGo. Shifts are short and crisp in the lower gears, so you can pull away quickly. The top three gears have a slightly longer ratio, but that should help you save fuel. This little iGo should only consume around four liters of fuel per 100 kilometers, but this can vary significantly in everyday city driving. And even with the new safety system, the iGo we're testing today will only set you back just under 13,000 euros in Germany. The good price and sporty design are expected to appeal mainly to young buyers. The headlights sit perfectly into the black lines, which crisscross along the front and flow around the entire car. Many of the interior and exterior features can be swapped and changed, so you can customize the car just to your liking. Enos likes the five-door model because there's better access to the back seats. She does find the back a little cramped for adults, though, and taller people may bump their head on the ceiling. There's not much in the way of legroom, either. She points out the brackets for child seats, though, which makes sense as kids would have more than enough space here. The car also features practical seatbelt holders to stop them getting trapped in the door. The position of the button for the park assist system is slightly odd, though, here at the back in the trunk. It's also equipped with a rear camera to give you better view when parking. This comes as standard in this iGo model. The stylish blue-black combo spills through into the interior. You can also connect your cell phone to the car and play music directly from there so you never have to go without your favorite tunes. And for our final test, the highway. Ina says the Toyota iGo is really a city car. But there'll be times you need it on the highway. It's already at maximum speed by 160 kilometers per hour. So if you want to accelerate or overtake, she says, you'll need a fair amount of time and space to make it work. When it comes to details, Enos thinks the designers have really gone all out. She's a big fan of the blue-black combination, which even adds a splash of color to the seats. She also likes the rear camera. It's a nice safety net, especially for new drivers. And you can even change your customization options years down the line, so you never have to worry about your taste changing. The legendary Alfa Romeo logo. Back in 1971, it graced the radiator grille of a front-wheel drive compact for the first time, the Alfa Zud. The Italian automaker hoped the car would help it attract new customers, and they wanted to stimulate the local economy too, as our classic car expert, Christoph Bauer, explains. He says the strategists at Alfa Romeo wanted to kill two birds with one stone. They wanted to extend the Alfa model range and help southern Italy's weak economy get back on its feet. Austrian car designer Rudolf Bruska was even given the mammoth task of creating the car. He'd previously worked under Ferdinand Porsche on the VW Beetle and had helped develop the Giulietta for Alfa Romeo in the early 1950s. Bruska made plans not only for the car, but also for a new factory in Pomigliano d'Arco near Naples. And he quickly dubbed the car the Alfa Zud, the Alfa of the South. Rudolf Ruska was well connected and assembled a team of former Fiat engineers. Starting from scratch, they designed a compact car that was very progressive for its time. It boasted plenty of space, 
an aerodynamic shape, and sporty performance. There was just one problem. Rust. Christoph says it quickly ruined the Alpha Zood's reputation. By the time the first vehicle inspections rolled around, some parts had completely rusted through, and a few Alpha Zoods were completely unsalvageable just after four years. That's because staff at the Alpha plant spent almost as much time on strike as they did working. So body shells sometimes spent weeks sitting around in the salty sea air, and rust set in even before they were painted. The company's quick fix of filling the vehicle's hollow cavities with synthetic foam just made things worse. It soaked up water like a sponge, producing more rust. That was a shame, because otherwise the Alpha Zood is a well-engineered car. Christoph explains that it was the first Alfa Romeo to use front-wheel drive. While safer than traditional rear-wheel drive, it can make for dull driving, but not in the Alfa Zood. It's fun and great on curves, thanks to Rudolf Ruska and his great suspension with McPherson struts at the front and a beam rear axle. Unusually for a front-wheel drive model, it tends to oversteer due to the negative camber at the front normally only seen in race cars. Except for a hatchback, the Alpha Zood had all the ingredients which would, three years later, make the first Volkswagen Golf such a success. Christoph says the Alpha Zood's design was decades ahead of its time. The short overhangs allow for a long wheelbase, and combined with the steep fastback makes for heaps of room inside. And that was head designer Rudolf Ruska's intention. He was almost two meters tall and wanted to build an Italian car that could seat four Central Europeans comfortably. The body was styled by none other than Giorgetto Giugiaro, designer of the first VW Golf. The Alpha Zood shape is very aerodynamic. A compact boxer engine allows for a flat hood and a low center of gravity. The sloping rear also optimizes airflow and improves handling. Inside, the car exudes a sporty kind of purism. Plastic and rubber are used to create a clearly arranged and ergonomic cockpit. The lack of creature comforts allowed Alfa Romeo to sell the car for an unbeatable price, equivalent to around 4,000 euros. Christoph is also impressed by the compact boxer engine with 1.2 or later up to 1.5 liters of cubic capacity. From the start, they left enough room to increase capacity. The first Alpha Zood from 1971 eked 63 horsepower out of 1.2 liters of cubic capacity. The car Christoph is driving has a 1.3 liter engine with an output of 68 horsepower. He says in 1972, German trade magazine Auto, Motor and Sport praised the car's incredibly quiet engine, which produced little vibration even at high revs. Yet the 1.3 liter boxer engine is very agile and you can even rev it up to 7,000 RPM for short periods. It's a real Alpha. So the little Alpha was able to live up to the great expectations buyers had of an Alfa Romeo. Soon, the car maker expanded the Alfa Zood range to include the Giardinetta station wagon and the Sprint Sports Coupe. Although over one million of these cars were produced, few have survived. Krista finds it tragic that today people only associate the Alfa Zood with rust because this car was arguably the most progressive of its time. Created in the 1960s, it was still state-of-the-art in the 1990s. Its design anticipated the shapes of many compact sedans built years later. For instance, Renault's Megane, marketed in 1995, or the 1999 Seat Lyon. So rust or not, Christoph says the Alfa Zood was a stroke of genius and a milestone in automotive history. At the time, competitors accused Alfa Romeo of selling the car at dumping prices. The Alfa Zood's Spartan interior, coupled with its progressive technology, added up to great driving pleasure at an affordable price. <laughs>